to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me are my co-hosts, Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Luton, and Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning. We're seeing a rise in the crypto markets. Uh, has everyone a little chipper this morning, I hope? <laughs> well, unless you're short. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a nice bounce. <laughs> We'll take a look. Checking That's in true. on Bitcoin, the Coinbase Bitcoin price XDX index is currently trading at thirty-four thousand four hundred and fourteen. Bitcoin is up about three point four percent over the past twenty-four hours, and the Coinbase Ether price ETX index is at twenty fifteen and change. ETH is up almost 9% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as a leader in crypto news events and data. So, right, we have the crypto markets up. I see that DeFi is up a little more. And Binance has some news over the weekend. It looks like uh, the regulators are cracking down on them ac across the globe and on in the UK, Japan issuing a warning as well as um, Ontario. Well, Ontario, they, yeah, they, this, they bailed out. In Ontario, yeah, they bailed this, out. It's not the first it warning. It's, it's not the first warning from Japan, but it's another warning from Japan. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I thought it was interesting, you know, kind of uh, what they said, it, you know, because Binance was like, oh, this doesn't affect Binance.com. But when you read the actual uh, the uh, announcement from from the uh, FCA in the UK, what they said was that uh, no other entity in Binance in the Binance Group holds any form of UK authorization, regular uh, registration, or license to conduct regulated activity in the UK. So it it just looks like they're saying, you know, Binance made it seem like it was just limited to uh, Binance Markets Limited, which is BML, which was their UK arm, and the UK is saying no, it's everything. So, you know, it's, it's kind mm -hmm. of a little murky uh, the, way, the way Binance is trying to spin it. But, yeah, I mean, you have the UK, you have Japan, and then they, they bailed out of Ontario because it seems like they, you know, they don't yeah. want to get involved with, you know, Ontario is a bit different. Yeah, for, well, they're preemptively no, making moves here because other crypto exchanges in Ontario have been issued warnings as well. I guess Binance is, reads the writing on the wall and is, uh, you know, taking action ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. In, in many ways, yeah, like Binance the way the U.S. Actually, says, Binance yeah. is actually good at reading the writing on the wall because they actually left China before the crackdown. So they, they kind of know, you know, sometimes they're good at reading those kinds of signals. I mean, a few okay. years ago, they left well, China, not recently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, Binance sh shouldn't be operating in the U.K. The Financial Conduct Authority warned on Saturday, a day after Japan's financial services regulator issued a similar notice to the crypto exchange. And the news comes as Binance, as we mentioned, pulled out of Ontario, the most populous province in Canada, following actions against other crypto exchanges for failing to comply with local securities laws. And joining us now to discuss is Henry Arzelanian, crypto leader at PwC. Welcome to the show, Henry. Thanks for having me, As Christine. always. So Binance is known for being on top of every innovation in the crypto space from tokenizing stocks, NFTs they're getting into, DeFi, they're on top of every novel financial product out there, which often means operating within a legal gray area. So are we now seeing a global crackdown, a case of Binance pushing the limits of regulators and now regulators are pushing back? Well, it's a, it's a good question because I think what was interesting in the case of the uh, FCA action against uh, Binance is not only they have to stop their regulated activities, uh, but also because they also have to stop all the advertisement they've been doing, uh, but and also uh, keep uh, secure and, and uh, store all the, the data information they have on their UK clients, which has been quite interesting. I think what, what actually was interesting as well, as we know, Binance uh, today has about 65% of the global crypto crypto to crypto market. I mean, just to put things in perspective, last month from about the two trillion dollars that was traded on crypto to crypto exchanges, one point five of that was actually on on Binance. So I think this the message that regulators try to think send here as well is that uh, the era of unregulated exchanges is coming to an end, and and they may take action regardless of how big or small you are.
Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, that, that's an interesting way to put it, because I think the, the real question here is that, um, you know, Binance hasn't actually really changed how they their business model. Right. They've always sort of been like, you know, citizens of, of the universe or whatever, however they define themselves. So, I mean, do you think this is a sign that are we going to start seeing this with other exchanges as well? I mean, Binance is a little bit of a unique situation, right? They kind of do their own thing. I mean, are you predicting that we're going to see kind of like a greater crackdown of other exchanges around the world? And are there other exchanges in particular that stand out for you? Yeah, it's a good question, Emily. I would say there, I expect that, I mean, to put things in perspective, the FATF just came out uh, this week mentioning that about 58 or it's 120 plus countries that our, our members have come up with some kind of uh, regulations on crypto exchanges and custodians, what they call VASPs. And actually, interestingly, 52 of those 58 are regulating crypto exchanges and custodians, and only six of them are, are banning them. I think the one area I expect to see a lot of enforcement over the next couple of months is really when it comes to crypto derivatives. You mentioned the case of Binance. Uh, today, about 25% of uh, open interest in Bitcoin uh, futures actually are on the uh, Binance platform. I even actually to put things in perspective again, over the from last month, from the uh, 2.5 trillion that were traded in Bitcoin futures, a bit trillion of that happened on the on the Binance uh, platform. So again, it really shows you the, the scope of these. So I expect to see uh, increased regulatory uh, clarity but also increase, reg increase regulatory enforcement uh, on a crypto exchanges, and particular uh, exchanges are offering crypto derivatives. Welcome back, Henry. Um, do you think that this is very particular to Binance, though, because they've been so opaque about their location? And, uh, I mean, we kind of know they're in Singapore, maybe, sort of, uh, but that's the point, right? We, we don't really know the exact details about Binance, and when you when you ask them questions, they're very they're very uh, they they hedge all their answers, and they're very dodgy about it. But do you think that that this is sort of like now the regulators are are trying to set an example, uh, not just not just to and, and focus on Binance, so that it reminds the rest of the crypto industry, look, you guys need to play our rules now. It's a good question, Lawrence. I think, uh, obviously, uh, I really expect to see the increased uh, regulatory uh, uh, kind of monitoring on crypto exchanges to continue over the next couple of months. Uh, I think one, one interesting thing that I've been, uh, you know, watching now is really, uh, you know, what's going to happen really with a lot of these unregulated exchanges. As you mentioned, uh, some of these exchanges really uh, do not, are not regulated anywhere, they don't, and they don't really have an onshore presence from that perspective. So I'm really watching to see what's going to happen. I think one thing the message the regulators are trying to send is very clear is that the era of unregulated exchanges is pretty much coming to an end and i think uh, yes you can try to hide uh, you can try to go to new jurisdictions uh but at one point whether you like it or not this is gonna the, the regulators will come and want to regulate the space let's not forget for most most regulators i mean if, uh, protection of the retail public and financial stability is uh, one of their core goals and as we're seeing increased usage increased trading and increased activity of crypto assets, uh, particularly by retail customers, I think it's very natural to expect regulators to come and actually try to put uh, some uh, some c control uh, around the industry. You know, just switching topics and taking a look, you mentioned regulation. China has been cracking down on mining. It seems they do this every year, though, mining and uh, uh financial institutions funding accounts with crypto exchanges. You tweeted out that Bitcoin block time now is 13.4 minutes. This is quite incredible. Not surprisingly, the difficulty level is expected to drop by over 25% on Friday. A new record main cause is the drop of global hash rate post China ban. And so what do you see in this new world of uh, mining amid these crackdowns in China? Where, where do you think it'll all go? And is this truly different from previous bans made by China. Yeah, Christina, as, uh, as as many of those who follow me on Twitter know, I've been following the crypto mining space very, very closely in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I really think what the some of the events that happened uh, in mainland China in recent weeks are uh, really game changing uh, in the sense that obviously in the past, uh, Bitcoin mining was kind of tolerated in China. And actually, the, the state council has made it very clear that this activity would not be tolerated. And actually, frankly, the the, the level that the level of the, the hash the hash drop that we've seen in really couple last two weeks has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and frankly, I think the, 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 the such a difficulty drop that we'll see of 25%, I think uh, it's not surprisingly we record. The one thing that I'm watching right now is really where is this mine is going to go? 
Uh, we, you know, uh, as we know today, until two weeks ago, uh, about 65% of Bitcoin mining happened in China, followed from the U.S. and then uh, Russia. Uh, so, uh, sorry, fr from the U.S., Russia, and obviously other countries like Kazakhstan. Uh, if I was a betting man and looking at what the activity that's happening, I think we're seeing a lot of that Bitcoin mining move towards North America, particularly the U.S. I wouldn't be surprised if I was a betting man, let's say 12 months from now, uh, to see that the majority of the Bitcoin mining, for example, is happening in the U.S. Uh, so I think it'll be very interesting to watch uh, what, what, what that means and what the impact will have. Practically, will it have an impact on Bitcoin network? Not really. Uh, will it have a, an impact on the operation of, of miners? Uh, it's probably, but again, it'll be just a geographical shift. I think one thing that this uh, recent crackdown has shown is that uh, really uh, the decentralized nature of Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin may happen in a country or another, but the reality is that the show goes on when it comes to Bitcoin mining. Do you think that Latin America can attract miners? You know, when you look at uh, Bitcoin uh, mining, we'll obviously three criteria. You look at obviously one of them is obviously cheap cost of electricity, uh, followed obviously by the cost of machine and then other ancillary costs. But really, obviously, the big component of it is is the cost of electricity. When it comes to that, obviously, hydro is by far the cheapest form of electricity, uh, 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 followed by others. You know, whether it's uh, solar, wind, and, and, and the likes. Uh, I think one intangible element now that is added is really kind of the uh, regulatory openness. Uh, to welcoming the miners. I think what happened in China last month, uh, you know, uh, will be in the memory of a lot of these miners. And I think as they make the decisions over the next couple of months, kind of the, how welcoming they feel wherever they go will be a big factor. And not surprisingly, actually, uh, there was a lot of reports of some of, let's say, U.S. Uh, state governors who have been trying to welcome some of these miners to come over. Uh, and I think that's that's going to be one thing that uh, people will be looking at. Very, By the way, not very dissimilar to have crypto exchanges when uh, regulators start ban uh, or regulating uh, crypto exchanges, uh, reg uh, crypto exchanges decide to go to jurisdictions where they felt welcome. I think it's very natural that we, we see the same thing happen with Bitcoin miners over the next couple of weeks and months. Yeah, I just read a quote, something about if you ban the future, the future will happen somewhere else. Thank you very much, Henry, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on. Thank you, Christine, Emily and Lawrence. Likewise. All right, that was PwC crypto leader Henry Arzlanian coming up, checking in on Asia and crypto markets update with UK-based crypto asset broker Global Block. Time now for the daily forecast and update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. Welcome to the daily forecast, June 28th, 2021. I'm Angie Lau, editor in chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. Coming up, we take a look at China's crypto mining exodus to Kazakhstan. Hong Kong reaffirms its commitment to a digital currency. And Forecast News kicks off a new series exploring China's big bet on blockchain. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. Kazakhstan has quickly become a favorite destination for crypto miners looking to exit China's ecosystem. That's as Beijing continues to come down heavily on mining within China's industry, which was considered one of the biggest producers of crypto. Forecast News has been following this exodus and has spoken with companies based in Kazakhstan, one of which has witnessed a surge in demand for their services. Thus far, mostly the demand was for hosting space. Uh, it's after this, this news from China that they're cracking down, uh, the demand has risen not only for hosting space, which is now completely contracted out in, in our facility, but now has increased to actually uh, an interest in building facilities. And this has come very quickly. Other companies in the country, though, are worried about different demands, ones that have to do with the country's limited energy infrastructure. Kazakhstan basically have only 18 million of population and power generation obviously is like has has limit so uh, this uh, electricity is already like used by miners spare electricity i mean not all hash rate distrib like distributing from china migrating from china will come to kazakhstan kazakhstan can absorb only 
maybe limited part of this. The government there is also eyeing the introduction of a tax that would require miners to pay one Kazakhstani tenj or 0.002 US dollars. That's a fraction of a penny per kilowatt hour for power they consume. This could come into effect next year. Okay, let's take a look at how markets fare today, starting with Bitcoin. It ended the trading day in Hong Kong up 5% to close just over 35,000 US dollars by 4 p.m. local time at the end of the Asian trading day. And in the top 10 for cryptocurrencies, nearly all of them ended the day in green, with Ethereum outperforming the rest after closing the day up more than 9%. Meanwhile, the Hong Kong government is pressing ahead with a digital dollar. The city's financial secretary, Paul Chan, letting the city's CBDC ambitions known this weekend. Chan wrote on his official blog that, quote, in a year, we will strengthen our preparation on using CBDC on a wholesale and retail level, including research on the e-Hong Kong dollar at the retail level. Now, Chan made the post following a tour of local businesses where he showed off digital wallets that residents will soon have loaded with vouchers in efforts to help boost businesses that have been hurt during the COVID-19 pandemic. Though the vouchers aren't exactly using CBDC, they are an indication that the government is moving full steam ahead with their plans and wants everyone to get used to the idea of a digital wallet. And finally, in a three-part series launching this week, Forecast News with support from the Judith Nielsen Institute's Asian Stories Project, we map out Asia's blockchain adoption, how China's ambitions influence regional innovations, and what the implications are for developed economies like the United States. And as Bitcoin disrupted money by allowing the exchange of funds without the need to involve banks, blockchain may fundamentally change how information is exchanged. While most people pay attention to crypto, businesses and governments are focusing on blockchain. I mean, Asia is definitely a kind of um, a major hub for, of uh, investment in uh, blockchain projects of, of all kinds. And uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of money. The people are uh, in many places rapidly getting more money. And so I, mean, I think from an investment standpoint, it's uh, very significant and going to be even more significant. You can read part one of the series and see the full video report up now on forecast.news. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Time now for a live look at Bitcoin. The Coindesk Bitcoin price XVX index is currently trading at $34,430. Bitcoin is slightly up about 3.2% over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk Ether price ETX index is up at 2013. ETH is climbing up there almost 9% over the day. Joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is Grant Whitlock, head of training at Global Block, a UK-based crypto asset broker. Welcome to the show, Grant. So would love to hear your insights on, we're seeing a bit of a Bitcoin bounce uh, over the past weekend. What's your outlook? And uh, Bitcoin seems to be trading within a range of 30, 35. Yeah, we're, we're back up there, or we were a few hours ago at $35,000. Um, <clears throat> we've dropped back down it's what, 34 and a half now. Um, still struggling to get through this uh, resistance level. And um, but we've, we've seen some good buyers this morning, um, all, all hope, hopeful that we'll get through this level. Mm -hmm. oh, is there anything different uh, from, you know, how Europe, how Europe is trading versus other regions in the world? No, well, <clears throat> obviously you've got a 24-hour market in a seven days a week product here. So I mean, I, I don't think you get the uh, the differences like you do in equities. Um, you know, we've got clients trading at 11 o'clock at night over here. So um, it, it, it's hard to break it down like that. Nonetheless, Grant, where are the flows coming from and where are they going? Uh, what, what other coins out, outside of Bitcoin or even Ether uh, is exciting in the markets right now? Uh, I mean, all eyes are on Bitcoin right now to see if it can get through this level. Um, you've got a few people kind of almost front running that. You look at Ether today up 9%. Um, we've seen some good buyers of Solana recently um, and a few other altcoins. But 
if it doesn't get there and it's back to 30,000, then these altcoins seem to get, you know, hit a lot more. So right now we're seeing more people sit in Bitcoin uh, and wait with a bit more conviction. Are, are, you know, when compared to ETH, though, are, are they looking at it? Um, are, I mean, are they pulling? F I mean, ETH is up 10 percent or, you know, it's, it's high today relatively to uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. I, is, is that is that attracting at least some of the capital away from Bitcoin? Well, we're certainly seeing some flow in that. But if you take it from the highs, you know, what Ethereum was four thousand three hundred dollars. It's, you know, 50 percent below that level, whereas Bitcoin uh, hasn't gone down as much. So as soon as you get an up day, we're seeing you know, a bit of frenzied buying and, and pushing the alts up, uh, generally at a higher rate than Bitcoin. But in a down day, they're obviously falling more as well. Greg, in your opinion, are we in fact in a bear market now? And if so, how long do you expect it to last? I don't think we are at the moment. Um, time will tell. We need to get above, buck above this $40,000 level, though. We've had probably what, four, five weeks now of negative price action, really. Hopefully that twenty-eight and a half was it, $29,000 level was the bottom, forming a bit of a, a base, cons consolidating, and then you know waiting for the next phase moving up. Um, if we go lower again still, then I think you know, we seriously need to be asking that question. It's interesting when you, you say that we're not a bear market because the technical definition of a bear market is when there's a fall of 20% or more. That, we've clearly seen that, but I guess that doesn't apply to the crypto markets or is this a, yeah, a small I, bear I mean, market it, within a bull market? Yes. I mean, look, we definitely had a pullback and yes, uh, we've had a 20% pullback and that makes it a bear market. But you're talking about a product that can move 20% in a day. So I don't think that we can take the old equity benchmarks and, and apply it to products that can literally move 20 25 percent in a day otherwise you know we could be in a bull in a bear market that could rotate three times in, in the same week um i think that this is a dip in a longer term longer bull trend however if we break twenty five thousand dollars if we you know if we get down to twenty thousand dollars then um you know i'll have been proved wrong so, so, Grant, where are you seeing those buy orders on the downside and the sell orders on the upside? Where is it heavily uh, concentrated? Well, we've been making lower lows and lower highs. So we've been seeing, you know, people flipping out at $34,500, looking to buy back at 30000 But a global block, predominantly, we have long-term hodlers. So they're, they're dip buyers rather than peak sellers. Uh, we do have... People, some people trading it, but they kind of they like the the long term story. They they see the fundamentals of each coin, and they'll be using dips to buy into, as opposed to kind of day trading. So we've seen like some of the major um, drivers of price action have been like Elon Musk or China. What what do you see as a as a likely factor to bring the price back up if the price were in fact to go up? I mean, is there, are there certain things that you'd be looking out for, like certain types of things that would uh, cause that to happen? Yeah, I mean, the golden ticket would be Apple saying it's bought some, put it on its balance sheet like Tesla did. I think <laughs> if we do that, then we're, you know, we're, we're off to the races. Um, <laughs> other, other than that, I mean, I actually welcome um, what's going on with Binance. Uh, I think it shows that it's a maturing market. that We are getting more regulated. Um, is Binance too big to fail now? Potentially. It's got such a huge market volume that either the regulators can persuade everyone in their own countries not to trade there and, and go somewhere else, or they make Binance a, a regulated entity so that they have the protection. Um, but I think it's endemic of, of, a, uh, of a maturing market that we're now having these conversations um, about regulation, which... We've probably, you know, one of the biggest hurdles to, to last year's, uh, sorry, last bull run, where it was a retail driven bull run, whereas now we've got lots of funds holding, you know, you only have to look at Grayscale and, and the amount of money they've got under, um, under management there. And you can see the investor appetite, the institutional investor appetite. But with that, they want the protection. Right. You're in the UK. You're directly affected by this uh, Binance regulatory questions going on. Uh, what, what do you see the uh, next steps or the fallout out of this? Well, we see, we've had a lot of 
you know, I've a lot of people which I didn't realize were in crypto sending me messages saying, is my money safe? Uh, that's that's the first thing that we're seeing. But secondly, if you're in the UK, you should be doing business with uh, either a FCA regulated or registered company, um, which offers you the protection. Uh, it's, it's as simple as that. All right. Grant, thanks for joining us this morning. Appreciate your insights. Thanks for having me on again, guys. Really appreciate it. That was Global Block Head of Trading Grant Whitlock coming up. Hong Kong's blockchain-based digital health passport and checking in with CoinDesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor, Nick Day. Coindesk indexes, the market standard for crypto assets since 2014. Our trusted data powers billions in publicly traded funds. Coindesk indexes are the standard used by institutions, and they're the key for investors looking to understand and access crypto markets. As the company that launched the world's first ever Bitcoin ETF, we at Purpose chose the Coindesk Bitcoin Price Index, the XBX, to price our assets. Coindesk indexes enabled the early adopters to build crypto investment vehicles, and they're already trusted by a new generation of global investors. Welcome back. Time to check in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto newsletter. Happy Monday there, Nick. Good to see you. So what are you looking at this week in D.C.? Any hearings that we should be on the watch for? Good morning. Yeah, the uh, biggest hearing is probably this Wednesday. The House Financial Services Committee uh, Subcommittee on Oversight will be hosting a hearing on the crypto frenzy. Uh, that's the direct quote from the title. Um, basically looking at the market activity over the last couple of months. And I believe this, will, uh, this one is being spearheaded by Representative Brad Sherman, who is, uh, of course, not a huge fan of the crypto industry. Nick, uh, welcome back. Um, I'm curious about what your take is on this Binance news. Like, is this just kind of regulators catching up with Binance, which is just like kind of we were just waiting for this to happen? Or is this an indicative of like a larger policy shift globally? I'm not sure if it's a policy shift, but it does sound like uh, some of these regulators are, um, you know, whether coordinated or not, are taking a you know, more firm stance on uh, activities within their borders. Um, you know, looking beyond just Binance, we've seen a number of other countries, you know, announce or implement different uh, regulations around crypto exchanges and who can operate within their borders. And a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, there has been a bull market over the last couple of months. And, you know, whether or not that's tapering now, there's still a lot of people who have you know, been given exposure to the crypto industry and to the markets. And a lot of regulators are a little bit concerned around, you know, whether or not people are about to lose their money or whether or not there's illicit activity. So this finance thing kind of fits into, you know, this broader pattern of people, of regulators looking at the markets and, you know, questioning whether or not everything is on the up and up. So Nick, do we have a, a former regulator running Binance in the US. Does that help inoculate Binance, at least for the time being on these shores? I think that that's going to get into like a bit of a complicated area, right? You know, to what extent is Binance US and Binance Global uh, already connected? Because, you know, of course, we had, you know, Ryan Brooks up on, you know, at CoinDesk Consensus event earlier this year. And, uh, you know, his refrain is that Binance US is not, you know, a strict subsidiary of the parent company. It is its own entity. And, you know, so... I think it's going to come down to, you know, how closely connected are Binance US and Binance Global? Are they the same company? Are they, you know, subsidiaries? Are they just kind of affiliates? Um, whether and how yeah. that question is answered will result in, you know, what you know whatever level of blowback there might be. It's a very fine regulatory type rope that they walk. All right. Thank you very much, Nick, for joining us. Thank you. That was CoinDesk Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. And as the Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. As the world executes a global vaccination campaign against COVID-19, data is key to tracking progress. Several blockchain solutions have emerged, such as New York's IBM-backed Digital Health Pass Excelsior. And earlier this month, Hong Kong launched a digital health passport in partnership with the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Consensus. Joining us now is Charles 
Dehasi, Director of Asia Pacific at Consensus, a blockchain software solutions firm focused on Ethereum. Welcome to the show, Charles. So what is the state of COVID-19 and quarantine rules in Hong Kong? Just like to uh, start off with that first right now. And how does this digital health passport help the situation? So I guess I guess the, the COVID-19 numbers are, are fairly under control here in Asia. Uh, people are getting their, uh, their jobs and, and numbers are getting well. We are still in kind of quarantine. Uh, the quarantine here in Hong Kong has been very, very tough. Uh, until a few uh, days ago, we, we would have to stay uh, three weeks in a hotel, a little bit like uh, our good friend Henry Arslanian uh, finishing his quarantine right now. But things are getting easier. Uh, and one reason is there is more and more data. And the project we've been working together with the Chinese University of Hong Kong is essentially a COVID data wallet, uh, helping the, the health uh, professionals uh, to kind of combine and gather all the data related to, to their COVID life. Uh, should they be taking uh, their temperature themselves? Should they, should they visit uh, an hospital with, uh, with exposure to, to COVID? And essentially creating better data for the government uh, to understand why, what are the behaviors of the, of the virus and, and who are the people most exposed. Uh, so we are very excited about this project. Uh, there is already more than 100 uh, healthcare professionals uh, onboarding on the platform and, and more to come. Uh, Charles, welcome. Uh, how much of that data, though, is shared with the Chinese government and what kind of data are they getting besides just vaccine records? Um, and if it's not tied to anything else, why need a blockchain uh, to do it? Why not just do it, let's say, on an Excel spreadsheet? Absolutely. I think the problem came from this Excel spreadsheet. So when you look at healthcare professionals, they will be they might be working on Monday in one hospital and on Wednesday moving to another, and they have to document a lot uh, about their exposure to COVID and how much tests and and weekly and daily tests they, they will be doing. And the reality of the market uh, for this uh, kind of, of data it was that the data was totally spread in all corners of the city, of the city uh, between your uh, your your GP, as uh, the hospital you visit, uh, the doctor you visit to get your injection, and all this data is actually siloed. So if you want to be able to share with your uh, with a doctor at the hospital uh, a full set of data about your COVID exposure, uh, it has to be a kind of uh, a data reconciliation. And that's where blockchain comes in. Uh, the patients are able to decide uh, to who they want to share the data for how long, and the data remain where the data belongs. So if you get tested into an hospital or if you get injected by uh, on, uh, on your vaccine by a, by, by a doctor in, a, in another facility, the data remain private. The data it is basically coming into the end of the users, and the users can bring to any doctor of their choice when they decide um, the full picture of their COVID exposure and, and COVID kind of related events. So, so using a centralized database will, will have not have worked. The, the, does the government get any of that data outside of just whether or not people were vaccinated? The government does not get data. It's very private data. Uh, there is regulations in Hong Kong for uh, data privacy, and uh, the platform has been designed to really fit uh, with this requirement. So even though we are in the world of blockchain and we used to see global networks where there is a lot of transparency, when you touch and generate uh, private data, such as healthcare data, uh, you, you really need to apply this, uh, these privacy laws, uh, which are in, in place uh, here as well in Hong Kong. Uh, Charles, just to change topics slightly, I mean, everybody's been following this crackdown happening on, on mainland China and cryptocurrency. And could you tell us a little bit of what is the situation like in Hong Kong? Uh, do you sense that there will be um, crypto traders or, or miners or whoever from mainland China coming to Hong Kong? Or I'm just curious how what you see the impact on Hong Kong's crypto market. Hong Kong has been for a very long time the center of crypto in Asia. Uh, people don't really realize, but we have here in Hong Kong more than three companies uh, which are listed in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange for some time now. Think of Huabi, OKX, and, and, uh, and OSL. Um, major, major exchanges such as BitMEX or, uh, or FTX are also operating out of Hong Kong for years. So Hong Kong has been a a blockchain and, and digital asset city for, for quite a while. The crackdown in China has not affected the city for now. Uh, we remain a special administration uh, region of, uh, of, uh, of China, uh, but we will see in the coming weeks if things are changing. Having said that, there is regulations which are coming into place also, and uh, which have been announced by the, uh, by the Hong Kong government regarding the protections of retail uh, crypto investors here. So in the coming months, uh, the, the so the companies operating here in Hong Kong, uh, we need to um, we need to 
to basically put in place the regulations of the of the local Hong Kong government. But on the other side, there is also a very strong support uh, of the Hong Kong government for the technology itself. If we put aside uh, the uh, the digital asset trading uh, type of activities, so we see, for example, the HKMA working with four central banks uh, on the MCBDC bridge, the multiple CBDC platform, uh, which has been designed and, and built by by consensus. And this is the first time you see four central banks. Uh, working together on a shared uh, shared platform to start to trade um, uh, CBDCs. So uh, a certain kind of look on crypto trading, but definitely a, a strong adoption and green light on, on the technology itself. Has the atmosphere okay, changed at least? Or the, the, has the atmosphere in Hong Kong changed as mainland China does all its crackdowns? No, for the moment in Hong Kong is uh, is as usual. You you see from time to time a, a tram, a local tram with a, a Bitcoin advertising. We don't have any any specific restrictions for now in Hong Kong. Charles, I am just curious with this digital health passport. Just one last question: Are people required to use it, or is this something that you know you see down the line maybe requirement? No, it's totally free. People can can choose to use it or not. Uh, I guess step by step, people will find the benefit of this kind of uh, of passport, uh, being able to travel more easily, uh, being able to to get access to more services more easily. So there is still a total freedom on, on usage of the of the service. Uh, but uh, I think in the coming months uh, there will be benefits, uh, and people will uh, will slowly be more incentivized to kind of use this uh, these new platforms. Okay, excellent, Charles. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, that was Consensus Director of APAC, Charles de Hossi. Time now to check in with Crypto Twitter with our tweet of the day. This one from Robert Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad, tweeting, the best time to prepare for a crash is before the crash. The biggest crash in world history is coming. The good news is the best time to get rich is during a crash. Bad news is the next crash will be a long one. Get more gold, silver, and Bitcoin while you can. Take care. He That tweet's getting a lot of uh, attention on Twitter right now. He specializes in personal finance. And that's it for First Mover. Coming up tomorrow, special guest Adrian Tricani, CEO and founder of Medico. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Lewitton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with all about Bitcoin. Coming up at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.